Well, welcome to this month's Ask Your Herb Doctor. My name is Andrew Murray, and uh, for this month, Sarah won't be with us, but she will be back in December. Uh, for those of you who perhaps have never listened to the shows that run every third Friday of the month from 7 to 8 p.m., uh, we're both licensed medical herbalists who trained in England and graduated there with a degree in herbal medicine. We run a clinic in Garberville where we consult with patients about a wide range of conditions, recommend herbs, supplements and nutritional counselling. So you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD Garberville 91.1 FM. And from 7.30 until the end of the show, at 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions either related or unrelated to this month's subject of vitamin D. The number here, if you live in the area, 923 or if you live outside the area, the toll-free number is 1-800-568-3723. That's 1-800-KMUD-RAD. And we can be reached toll-free on 1-888-WBM-HERB for consultations or further information, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Well, first things first, uh, we're very close towards the end of the pledge drive. Um, there's lots of people here doing all the support that it takes to run a show like this and a radio station uh, that can't emphasize enough is pretty unique in the States uh, in terms of free speech radio. Uh, I know in England, free speech radio uh, was kind of maligned and uh, pretty much kept in a very fringe uh, area in broadcasting, uh, but not given any support other than local support and that's what keeps this show alive so thank you so much to all the people that are pledging money making donations supporting the radio show keeping it on the air to make this kind of program and all the other excellent programs that KMUD brings that are just filled with alternatives so this is an alternative medicine show and the other alternatives uh, are also valuable outside uh, sources of information that you're not going to get from the mainstream. I think in this last political campaign, without being politically uh, uh, sided, I would say that more so than ever, we have seen the mainstream or lamestream media completely, completely eradicated, uh, disingenuous and uh, completely false so um it's excellent to see alternative radios uh news sites and websites coming with the internet and the age of free information uh i thought it's a very one very uh small piece i just wanted to say about the internet and it's uh the icnn uh handover it was under american uh governance for a long time but um uh, the present administration decided to pass that off but i'm not too sure whether this incoming administration will be able to do anything about that before the uh, censorship uh, carries on like it is in china for sure okay so uh, this month's talk is on vitamin d uh, most people will have recognized vitamin d probably from rickets uh, in the early 1900s i know in england uh, and in many countries that are north of 37 degrees there is really very insufficient sunlight, especially in the winter months, uh, to generate vitamin D. And so rickets was a fairly common presenting condition and still is in some parts of the world. Uh, so we're once again very pleased to have Dr. Raymond Pete with us, who's a, uh, a wealth of information and uh, never seems to be any end to the things that he knows, the things that he's found. And his insights are, as always, uh, outside the box. So thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Pete. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess first things first, would you uh, just outline your professional and academic background for those people who perhaps have never listened to the show, uh, and then I can get into the uh, questioning and I'd like to run along the lines of the uh, vitamin D subject. Um, basically, a, a PhD in biology, uh, including uh, reproductive physiology and biochemistry at the University of Oregon. I know you've... Uh, I know you've got plenty more uh, in terms of um, research background, and I know it's led you in very many different directions. Um, steroids and their production and their uses, uh, etc. Et I know you're uh, very interested in the uh, anti-aging for 
one of the one of the uh, uh, reasons of uh, pregnenolone and or progesterone in its anti-inflammatory and anti-aging effects. Um, now, vitamin D is actually a pro pro hormone. It's not tr- it's not strictly speaking in the sense of the word of a vitamin, is it? No, no, no. So, uh, in terms of the uh, discovery of vitamin D and its association with rickets. Um, do you think do you think there's adequate vitamin D uh, in the general populations? Um, for preventing rickets, um, they're pretty pretty much um, all all around the world. Uh, there is very little rickets left, but uh, since since the idea of vitamin D as a rickets preventing substance. Uh, was established, uh, that really cut off thinking and research about what vitamin D really is and what it's doing. Uh, and uh, if in the uh, 1950s, uh, there was a period when uh, people started uh, thinking about nutrition for themselves, like uh, Adele Davis's books came out, and uh, the, the medical establishment reacted uh, to discourage the public from using uh, their own uh, therapy. uh, For example, uh, vitamin A, uh, there were stories about how horribly toxic it was. It would destroy your brain and make your skin fall off. And uh, Very little evidence backing it up. You you can poison rats and mice, giving them a, a million or so units of vitamin A. The same, uh, there were some animal experiments with uh, gigantic doses of vitamin D, and supposedly uh, there was a case of a a baby whose mother uh, gave it a million or so units of vitamin D, and uh, or took it while she was pregnant, and uh, it supposedly caused the bones to thicken so much that there was no room for the brain to develop. And, And so the Newspaper stories in the 50s were saying that uh, vitamin D causes brain damage. And uh, I had been reading Adele Davis in the 50s, uh, but uh, despite that, uh, I was sort of uh, directed away from uh, vitamin D because there was uh, such a a taboo about anything more than uh, two or 300 units per day. Okay, this, it's interesting. You, um, you've uh, said that rickets is relatively unknown um, in the world. I know in England, and uh, just since I since I've lived here for fifteen years now, but I know I kind of keep in touch uh, with some of the news uh, that comes from time to time. That's worth looking at. And uh, I know in England, uh, especially in northern England, they were saying that rickets was starting to appear again. It's kind of a little bit off the tonight's uh, uh, subject, really, but. Um, the advent of fear mongering uh, from cases of skin cancer, melanoma, uh, the use of sunscreens, the inherent phobia about being in the sun, uh, all of this was actually implicated in the uh, uh, British Medical Journal as being causative for the rise in rickets. It was being seen again by doctors, and there, uh, some people were had never seen it before. It was kind of the first times for thirty and forty year old doctors. Um, so there is there is definitely a uh, 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 an amount of rickets that seems to be in the populations that are uh, at northern latitudes, but um, in terms of the vitamin D uh, levels um, measured on blood tests, uh, I know I've seen people with very low vi- vitamin D, and I know just like uh, TSH as a measure of the uh, call, the body's call for thyroid hormone has been down-revised by the uh, uh, Endocrinological uh, Association of the USA. They brought it down from 4.5 to 3.5, highlighting the fact that there are more and more people uh, with hypothyroid-type tendencies, and so this figure's been down-regulated. I know the uh, levels with uh, vitamin D, uh, the beneficial levels have been... Uh, raised so that the lower limit, I think, was 20 uh, 
nanograms per mil. Now they've raised that to 30, and a lot of people and places are advocating levels of 50 to 70 nanograms. And in fact, for athletes, I think they've even come up with studies that show there's positive associations for 100 nanograms per mil blood levels of vitamin D. Um, what do you what do you think about that? Even in the absence of rickets, that there is a oh, oh. tendency in the population to have low. Yeah, uh, several of the uh, conditions that are well associated with vitamin D deficiency, uh, some of them have doubled and tripled uh, in the last uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, and uh, it looks like it's uh, because of that fear of the sunlight, using <laughs> sunscreen and such. Uh, I've talked to a few people who had uh, 10 or below Mm-hmm. Uh, nanograms per milliliter uh, or 15 or, or 20 and uh, their condition really uh, corresponded to uh, how low they were uh, like one woman in her 60s uh, said she was so weak she could hardly uh, walk uh, her, her um, muscles were simply very very weak and shrunken mm-hmm. and um, she had I think it was 7 or 8 NG per ml Wow, and uh, within a week of taking uh, just a moderate, I think it was five five thousand units a day, uh, she could walk around. And uh, when you look at the the symptoms of people with uh, fifteen NG per ml, uh, twenty, twenty five, and so on, you can see gradations of that weakness, depression, uh, uh, shrinking muscles. Uh, uh, insensitivity to insulin, Mm -hmm. tendency to uh, have high blood sugar, uh, 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 all of of the uh, most common uh, diseases of stress. Right, blood pressure is also associated positively, isn't it, with a uh, lower level of vitamin D? Um, Yeah, everything related to aging and degenerative disease. And stress. uh, uh, Atrial fibrillation, uh, enlargement of the ventricle, uh, calcification of the valves, degeneration of, of the valves in several different ways, yeah. uh, hardening of the arteries, uh, calcification of, of the coronary arteries, and uh, even uh, calcification to, to the extent of what they call a, a heart stone, a huge mass of calcium. Wow. Okay, uh, we'll get in. We'll get into plenty of the plenty of the uh, different conditions for which there's been lots of peer-reviewed papers written uh, on uh, processes that I, I actually wasn't that aware of. I was, I think, probably like most people, have just um, associated uh, vitamin D with uh, calcium and uh, phosphorus metabolism, weak bones, uh, osteomalacia. Uh, and you know degenerative um, skeletal type uh, situations but there's a very clear and positive link to energy production and inflammation and I know the last few shows that we've done with you uh, you've been looking a lot at inflammation and the processes uh, producing inflammation and the sequelae of inflammation and how how inflammatory processes in general are extremely uh, uh, destructive and uh, counterproductive to energy production. Uh, when, when you look at the, the mechanism of just the outline that uh, calcium helps to uh, balance, or, or vitamin D helps to balance the uh, relation between calcium and phosphate um, to um, uh, prevent uh, the overaccumulation of phosphate uh, and to keep up the... Uh, the right level of calcium. Uh, when you look at, at the uh, relation of, of that balance to inflammation, uh, it, it turns out that um, it's really a, a serious problem in the population, uh, the amount of, of phosphate relative to calcium. Right, and that's because people aren't eating enough dairy? Um, or, or green leaves. Yeah. Green leaves mm-hmm. and, and uh, cheese and milk uh-huh. are really the the major good sources of, of calcium and meat, uh, uh, nuts, grains, beans, all of those have terrifically high phosphate contents. Right. And, uh, uh, that, the the, the um, excess phosphate and the reaction of the parathyroid hormone uh, to that high phosphate intake 
it's exactly the same as a deficiency of vitamin D. So too much phosphate, too little uh, vitamin D, and you get uh, what amounts to a, an early stage of chronic kidney degeneration. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, parathyroid hormone and phosphate are called uh, uremic toxins, right. late stage uh, kidney disease. But uh, people are, are starting that process very early when they don't eat enough calcium and vitamin D. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I want to talk a little bit about um, the uh, natural conversion in the skin, uh, the process by which sunlight activates um, the pre cholesterol precursor, uh, and then how those uh, metabolites are changed in the liver first and then in the kidney and how they become active and how this could play out um, in people with liver disease uh, as well as kidney disease and how this could negatively impact them because they've automatically um, weakened the process by which uh, this pro uh, pro-hormone is converted into the active form. So you're listening to Ask Your Herb Doctor on KMUD 91.1 FM um, from 7.30 until the end of the show at 8 o'clock. You're invited to call in with any questions. Uh, Dr. Ray Pete is joining us once again. Um, we're discussing the uh, widespread use of vitamin D and how important it is, and I think the uh, lack of sunlight and the phobia surrounding uh, sun and cancer, how this is all playing into decreasing our levels and how there aren't that many foods that really produce uh, or have enough vitamin D in them to actually keep levels of vitamin D at good levels and how those levels have actually been raised uh, in terms of the reference range for blood tests showing a positive association with increasing levels of vitamin D and decreasing disease. So, number here if you're in the area is 923 uh, If you live outside the area, there's a 800 number, which is 1-800-568-3723 or 1-800-KMUD-RAD. So, uh, uh, lines will be open from 7.30 on. So, Dr. Pete, I'm talking about the conversion in the skin, and again, I wanted to also bring up the fact that uh, I had heard and read that washing directly after sunbathing was actually counterproductive because you can wash uh, the uh, precursor metabolite off of the skin. Um, don't know how you uh, how you view that as true or that's just some bad science. And then the conversion of the uh, cholesterol type molecule in the skin into the uh, uh, twenty five hydroxy form and how that is then further hydroxylated downstream by the kidneys to the active form. Um, what do you think first about washing if you're sunbathing? And I think I read only 20 minutes was necessary to produce peak amounts of the pro-hormone so that um, your body actually stopped producing uh, more after about 20 minutes. So it wasn't necessary to lie out in the sun all day to get adequate vitamin D from sun exposure, from UVB uh, mainly. I, I think that's only when you're um, in uh, the middle of the day at a moderate latitude. The um, UVB is so low uh, most of the year in the high latitudes uh, that it takes a long time to get enough. But um, in like from 11, uh, 10, 10 to 2 in the summer in high latitudes, uh, it only takes 15 or 20 minutes to get enough. Okay, because there's a, there's a definite um, a decrease in UVB exposure with angle of the sun. I mean, I'm, yeah. So, okay, um, given that you're perhaps, I don't know, down in San Francisco um, or at that kind of latitude, then from, I don't know, probably September through to April, May, you're probably not, again, getting exposed to enough sunlight. And if you are, you'd probably need to be out in the sun probably for an hour or two then rather than 20 minutes. Um, yeah, and the color of your skin, uh, the natural color, uh, makes a tremendous difference and age makes a difference. Uh, there is apparently less uh, cholesterol metabolism and such in an old person. And uh, just the uh, degree of pigmentation uh, influences the, the amount of uh, reaction you have to the ultraviolet. Right. So that uh, in Mexico, for example, uh, even women who are outside all day, if they have dark skin and are only exposing uh, their their face and hands, uh, they tend to be uh, deficient in vitamin D, yeah. even at high altitude and uh, brilliant sunlight. 
Because hmm. I've read the uh, <coughs> association between our previous kind of agrarian lifestyle, or at least uh, labour based lifestyle where most people worked um, for a living uh, with manual labor. I don't mean people don't work at computers or whatever these days, but uh, manual labor, they're outdoors and more uh, associated with agrarian lifestyles, farming, um, and just being outdoors, whether it's cutting wood or you know any other outdoor activity. Um, those people obviously then were getting exposed to sun um, but obviously with our uh, modern lifestyles, you know, most people are kind of indoors and sedentary, which brings its own other negative uh, components to health. But in terms of the um, amount of sun that people get and using supplementation, uh, I think probably supplementation is one of the easiest ways to go about getting adequate levels of vitamin D because I don't think, but do you think people get enough vitamin D from the food that they eat? Uh, no, that, that almost impossible yeah. um, if, if you drink say two to four quarts of vitamin D supplemented milk right. um, if it isn't whole legal it has to be supplemented with right. vitamin D but uh, that's only uh, I forget um, I don't know what the current amount is but um, it I think has been uh, around uh, 300 units okay per quart, something like that okay per quart wow and they i think the modern uh, modern levels that are advocated now are up to two thousand i know two to four thousand iu per day um so if you're getting 300 iu from a quart of vitamin d four to five milk uh it's going to take a lot of milk to reach that and it it is in a few other uh foods uh, things like oily fish but I, again i know you're not an advocate of oily fish from a poofer perspective um Egg yolks as well, I think, were, uh, I think, 20 IU per egg yolk. <laughs> so, so you're not going to get a lot of vitamin D from eggs either. Is there any other forms of uh, uh, vitamin D-rich uh, foods? Oh, well, mushrooms. Mushrooms. They've been exposed to light, have a lot. But, um, Interesting. The, um, during the 40s and 50s, the, uh, the main form of supplemental vitamin D was synthetic. Right. I... Uh, ultraviolet irradiation of fungus and uh, the um, research that uh, changed the, the um, popularity of that uh, claimed that um, it was responsible for the hardening of the arteries of young people uh, starting in the 40s and 50s. And, and this hard, sorry to interrupt, but this hardening was because of calcium dep deposition, aberrant calcium? Uh, uh, yeah, which normally happens in a, a vitamin D deficiency, but um, mm -hmm. uh, there were publications arguing that the use of the synthetic uh, vitamin D uh, might have been contributing to abnormal calcium metabolism. I, I don't know if that's true, but uh, that uh, came out around 1970, and uh, milk uh, additives uh, switched over to uh, vitamin D3, right after those articles came out. So I think they were just being cautious. So you said, uh, you said earlier that mushrooms exposed to light are a significant source of vitamin D. Did you know, have you any, any uh, figures in terms of per ounce or uh, of mushrooms consumed, what, you, what you'd get? Um, no, I don't. No. It depends on the, the type of mushroom and the intensity of the ultraviolet. Interesting, because we always think about mushrooms just growing in the dark or in the woods or something. So um, they they would irradiate with UVB then mushrooms at uh, some point in our in our uh, history. Um, yeah, and uh, if they gather them outside, just being exposed to daylight so, uh, for a few hours uh, is enough. Uh, uh, there have been studies using mushroom powder uh, as a vitamin D supplement. And, uh, Wow. It only took, a, a, I think it was less than an ounce of powdered mushroom to uh, make a distinct rise. Uh, it, it actually depressed the uh, vitamin D3 and increased the vitamin B, D2. Wow. That's interesting. I've never heard of that. So, so this would be things like the uh, common um, uh, field mushroom, the white kind of... Uh, um, um, the white um, agaric mushroom that's kind of common uh, culinary mushroom that would be growing in the fields, button mushrooms. So these, these would be sources? 
Um, yeah. If, if they've been ex- exposed at all to sunlight, yeah. uh, they probably account for why many people have a measurable amount of, of D2 in their serum. Interesting. Now, the other thing is, I just want to re, uh, uh, go back a little bit. You've been an advocate of mushrooms uh, specifically for something else, haven't you, for um, producing a, a, a soup of mushrooms and having this as a, uh, a, a dietary supplement. Um, yeah, for the uh, anti-inflammatory, yeah. anti-cancer functions, yeah. Yeah. mainly. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, so... I guess getting on to specific uh, diseases that have been characterized with low vitamin D <clears throat> and how the uh, studies have shown uh, in cohorts of people that they've tested, um, those with higher initial levels of vitamin D uh, did better in uh, the outcomes than those with low. I, I know we, I've always associated vitamin D with bones because of rickets. I think most people have. I don't know how many people are actually aware of the uh, cancer association uh, with vitamin D, how many people are associ- uh, associate TB and multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis uh, with vitamin D. But um, I'd like to bring out some of these things and um, get your perspective on the inflammation that's happening and how you tie in the inflammatory process uh, through parathyroid hormone, which I know you've always said is I- I- inflammatory, and how, you know, p- through using thyroid hormone uh, uh, and pregnenolone be- being two anti-inflammatories which quell that inflammatory cascade, cascade, how they tie into how you see these inflammatory disorders that I've mentioned, you know, rheumatoid, MS, um, etc., cancers. So looking at um, something that I haven't mentioned, which is fibromyalgia, I saw that there was a, uh, a definite, uh, well, it was the- a theoretical mechanism because they haven't tested it any further, but I know the uh, fibromyalgia syndrome uh, where people have very tired, aching muscles and they feel muscle-bound and they di- just can't move because their muscles are functioning. I know you'd probably associate that more with hypothyroidism and, and low thyroid uh, state because you've clearly uh, spoken many times about the uh, patella or the Achilles uh, tendon reflex, uh, and that's a direct response of the muscle not being able to repolarize quick enough, and this lag phase that happens with the twitch. Uh, how how do, you, um, do, do you see fibromyalgia in terms of vitamin D deficiency being relative to uh, energy production and, and repolarization? Or? Uh, I, I think it's um, parallel, almost identical to the hypothyroid condition. Uh, all of the inflammations that you get with low thyroid function are uh, structurally and functionally similar to those you get from a vitamin D deficiency. And uh, the um, thyroid-stimulating hormone uh, is an agent of those inflammatory processes, uh, actually more than the, the direct effect of thyroxin, which lowers TSH, the TSH itself directly activates and and causes tissue to release the inflammatory uh, cytokines, interleukins, and so on. And uh, parathyroid hormone does that. And just by taking vitamin D or increasing your calcium intake or decreasing your phosphate relative to the calcium, uh, all of these changes in your diet will lower both TSH and parathyroid hormone. And both of these hormones are directly involved in things such as mast cell activation, uh, releasing histamine and serotonin, uh, increasing all of the cytokines, tumor necrosis factor, nitric oxide, uh, all of the things that... uh, promote degenerative inflammatory processes. Uh, So uh, functionally, uh, vitamin D and and thyroid are are really uh, parallel. You can't quite separate them. Okay. And then um, looking at the uh, uh, response the immune system uh, uh, mounts to uh, infection or um, cancer or inflammatory responses. Um, there are lots of um, papers uh, published for uh, 
Uh, and again, this is a little bit um, of a divergence. I know uh, tuberculosis as a, as a lung disease, um, there are other lung-type uh, pathologies uh, which were s definitely seemed to improve and had or lower um, morbidity associated with it with people that had higher vitamin D levels. Um, uh, just looking at people, uh, their vitamin D level when they're brought into hospital, uh, the uh, higher the vitamin D when they come in, the more likely they are to go out alive. Right. <laughs> okay, good point. So uh, I think it's probably a no-brainer if somebody's in, for many different, uh, I, I mean, how many, how many different illnesses are there that you can say don't have an inflammatory portion to them? Not too many, right? I think uh, inflammation is one of those widespread systemic processes that happens in many pathologies. And so uh, I think just uh, recognizing that vitamin D is Im implied uh, in inflammation, so, uh, suppressing inflammation, uh, would, make, would make anybody want to supplement with vitamin D, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, and um, HIV, AIDS, mm -hmm. uh, malaria, as well as tuberculosis are uh, yeah. uh, very widespread uh, conditions that are known to uh, increase their uh, morbidity and mortality in proportion to how low the vitamin D is. Yeah. I'd read an article about um, a compound called catholicidin, uh, and this was an a antiviral defense that, again, was heightened by uh, vitamin D in the body, and that lower levels uh, produced lower levels of this, other com this compound and, and also decreased uh, natural interferon production. So these would um, tend to implicate viral uh, conditions to be positively associated uh, or the outcomes of uh, viral conditions to be positively associated with increased vitamin D. Um, yeah, and I think the, the viral uh, process is basically an energy process. When, when the cells are well energized, they're resistant to uh, infection and replication of viruses. Right. And again, you're just saying that's from an energetic point of view to be able to withstand uh, the processes that cost e energy to drive a system uh, more positively than uh, being overwhelmed, as it were. Yeah, and I, I think you can see the energy process in, in the brain conditions that, that are associated with vitamin D deficiency. Um, uh, Brain-injured patients uh, have very low vitamin D uh, and uh, probably the injury itself is uh, uh, causing it to be lost in some way. I, I, did, I read that Parkinson's was also, uh, they were also Im Im implicating low levels of vitamin D in, in some Parkinson's um, patients, showing that that was a uh, kind of interference, either with dop dopaminergic type interference or uh, another neural signaling interference that vitamin D positively uh, influences. And the prion diseases are probably influenced because uh, vitamin D prevents the uh, polymerization of the prion protein, which is involved in uh, scrapey, mad cow disease, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and probably several other of the uh, degenerative brain diseases. Uh, anxiety and, and depression are uh, associated with very low vitamin D. Yeah, interesting. Again, that's, that's an interesting uh, thinking about things like, uh, from an herb, herb perspective, things like uh, hypericin from St. John's Wort being a classic uh, treatment for depression and how the uh, uh, alchemists classified uh, St. John's Wort way back <laughs> before, that, before there was any quote-unquote science although they were very uh, very methodical and very scientific in their own right, they classified it as, as uh, heating and drying in the third degree, saying that it was a solar herb ruled by the sun. And so that, again, anxiety and depression uh, with St. John's work use is kind of uh, hand in hand with the sun and its energizing effects. Uh, if we want to get um, kind of holistic about the uh, uh, mechanism by which that works. Okay, well, you're listening to Ask Your Herb, Dr. Kami D. Galvable, 91.1 FM. Uh, from now until the end of the show, 8 o'clock, you're invited to call in with any questions related or unrelated to this month's subject of vitamin D, its metabolism, and the effects that it has on the body. Uh, it looks like, sounds like someone's coming into the show to do some plug-in for the uh, uh, pleasure drive, so let's bring him in now. Come on. Hello, 
Okay, thank you so much. So uh, we're stealing the airwaves. Go ahead. <laughs> we go ahead. That's the reason. The reason we're here is because people contribute and they pay for it and they support it and. It wouldn't happen otherwise. Right. And we need the community support. And there's a reason we have, you know, that why you're on the air and why we have these talk shows is for the community to communicate right. with each other. And it's a really important aspect of KMUD. And uh, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Oh, no, you're welcome. Man. Yeah, for being here. Yeah, My name's Ruby, Voice in the Ether, by the way. And I'm, and, and I'm Rob. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I, especially when I started listening to this station when I moved out here, I I always thought of the talk shows as sort of the community sitting around the campfire, you know, exchanging stories and ideas. And uh, I don't think that's too far off from what actually happens. So how far are we from breaching the... Uh, oh, re we're close. Re yeah, yeah, I saw that. Actually, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> we're at $91,146. So All thank right. you so much, callers, and for calling in to 923-3911. And we only need another 3500 uh, no, yeah, 91,000. If you say 91 yeah. something, this says 90,000. We're so close. So please yeah. call in and uh, uh, pledge and donate and give. We're not far away, so it's very important that we keep this station fully funded. I mean, over and above, the 90, 95 is a goal, but obviously any more over and above that is totally works towards supporting the show. Uh, oh, keeping we the always radio appreciate on the, the extra funds, yeah, that's absolutely. for right. sure. It, it, it always disappears at, at least as fast as it comes in. <laughs> that's one of the sad realities. Well, Did we, um, where are we at with that $1,000... We're really close. We um, we made uh, about a third of it, but we still need a little bit more, and we're trying to reach that before eight. And so, um, let's call in nine two three three nine one one. And um, yeah, so the way a challenge works is somebody antes up a thousand dollars, but we don't get that money until other people match that challenge. So, like I said, we have a little over six hundred dollars to go until we meet the challenge. So. Nine two three three nine one 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 eight hundred K Mud Rad. We've got a whole half hour to do it, but don't waste time, folks. <laughs> nine two three three nine one one. We'll let you get back to it. Thank you. Andrew. No problem. Yeah, you're welcome. Shit. All right. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll get right back to the uh, topic of vitamin D and uh, its association with various pathologies here that I think some of which I hadn't realized until I uh, started looking at this information uh, earlier on today. Um, okay, so if, it, if you're in the area and or on the Internet and you have any questions, again, 933-3911, I know people are going to call in and pledge. That's what we want. So let's see the lights lighten up and see who's calling. Uh, there is a uh, 800 number, which is 1-800-KMUD-RAD. Uh, for those people either listening to the internet or uh, in a different state, we often have people from the uh, middle of the country and the East Coast calling. So, so Dr. Pete, um, I said at the, the beginning when I started uh, introducing uh, this subject for this evening that I found a, a very interesting parallel. Um, but I, again, I'm always very cautious how far down the rabbit hole to go, knowing that there's such a lot of uh, misinformation, and especially in science. I mean, talk about talk about a, uh, rev a revelationary uh, electoral cycle. Uh, what we've seen from the mainstream media, what we've seen, uh, all the stunts they've pulled, all the lies, all the cover-ups, all the conspiracy. Um, it's everywhere, and I, I don't believe that it's not in medical journals or in... Uh, in, especially in pharmaceutical uh, press releases. Um, so getting to the, getting to the subject of uh, the conversion of vitamin D, first in the liver and then in the kidneys, uh, before it becomes active, are you, are you aware of anything that would bypass the necessity for healthy livers and healthy kidneys in order to have adequate vitamin D. If not, that, I think, is a main stumbling block that people need to know about and hear about. Um, I, I think the um, low level of vitamin D and calcium is probably uh, the cause of the sick liver and kidneys. Interesting. Go on. And uh, rather than being a product, and, and so... Uh, Supplementing uh, just with uh, calcium and, and vitamin D, I think, uh, in many cases, will uh, correct the uh, whatever the liver and kidney problem is. 
and, and that uh, it, it isn't a, a matter of uh, curing uh, the the disease so that they can make uh, or activate vitamin D. It's a matter of uh, getting the vitamin D and calcium into the system, and and maybe you don't need to think about uh, the disease of the uh, kidney and uh, liver as having some other mysterious cause, hmm. such as a virus. Okay, because uh, I, I uh, read one particular uh, uh, abstract that um, seemed to show that the... Uh, okay, this was the other subject, vitamin D receptors. Now, given that uh, I think you have said that there are many different places where the tissues in many different organs and other tissues, including uh, nerve, presumably, uh, where vitamin D receptors are located. So they are ubiquitous, um, a little bit like uh, the uh, sites that are binding sites for various different molecules or uh, hormones or drugs or other things that the body produces. But in terms of the uh, what they call the vitamin D receptor and its ubiquity in the body, um, is it reasonable, um, if you know, but is it reasonable to increase the amount of vitamin D receptors that your genotype would express in order to um, overcome any shortfall in the absorption of vitamin D or the, uh, you know, the, the pickup of vitamin D? Um, uh, the um, receptor is um, the problem of some of the uh, stress conditions uh, make the rece- receptor disappear. Make uh, them disappear? Yeah. yeah. So that um, I think the, uh, getting enough calcium and vitamin D and good uh, nutrition generally uh, is necessary to um, make sure that you aren't suppressing the receptors. So you... uh, and some of the receptor uh, repression is is done by overmethylation, okay. and, and that can be huh. uh, uh, something that uh, your mother, uh, would, for example, was was deficient in vitamin D or calcium. Uh, that sets up a methylation pattern uh, in subsequent offspring that, that can affect their uh, sensitivity to vitamin D uh, by methylating. The, the receptor or, or um, uh, other interacting. Do, do you know um, how long-lived these um, uh, receptors are then? If you talk about a kind of transcriptional event that occurs uh, in the DNA to produce all these different things, of one of which is a vitamin D receptor, which is so important because it has such an implication in so many different inflammatory processes, and not just uh, degenerative bone disease, but down to cancers. How um, how long these uh, vitamin D receptors last once they've been produced, and therefore, if you're talking about the overmethylation. Uh, being negatively associated with these uh, vitamin D receptors disappearing or not being produced. Yep, that would be the rate at which they're replaced. And I don't know specifically how long they last, but uh, other receptors are typically turning over uh, very fast right. so, so the cells can uh, remain uh, adaptable, uh, usually uh, just uh, two or three days and, and much, yeah. much of the receptor has been recycled okay we do have a caller on the air so let's take this first caller caller you're on the air where are you from hello hi you're on the air where are you from uh phyllisville oh phyllisville hi um yeah i um a while back was uh had a vitamin d test and i was kind of low and they said um uh you know to take more and then i think i was checked a while later and they said i was on the low end of normal, but I still mm-hmm. needed to up it. Right. And they suggested I take 5,000 units mm-hmm. a day. So mm-hmm. I was taking 5,000 units a day, but I also take a multivitamin, kind of a strong multivitamin mineral. I'm a little older, so I want to make sure I get everything I need. And um, I noticed that the uh, multivitamin had 3,000 units in it. Mm-hmm. So that meant if I was taking um, both every yeah. day, I'd be getting 8,000 a day 
Is that too much? Well, I would, I would wonder first how, uh, how uh, quantitative the, uh, the amount was actually in the tablet, if it said 3,000, and how bioavailable it was over a liquid form, if that was... Uh, it was a liquid capsule. That's the 5,000. Uh, okay, yeah, the liquid capsule was a 5,000, but what the, the 3,000 one that was in the multivitamin, and that yeah, was in Yeah, that was tablet. in a big pill. Yeah. Like, so, Dr. P, 8,000 8, IU, if she got 8,000? Uh, yeah, if you figure that um, being in a bathing suit in the sun for uh, 20 or 30 minutes enough to just start turning pink, uh, that can make ten or 15,000 units. Oh, so okay. It, uh, five or 10,000 units is never going to be harmful. So that's not going to be harmful. So if I take, because uh, I was starting to take the 5,001 every other day because I take the other one every day. Did but you think I should go back to taking the 5,000 every day with the uh, multi? Yeah, I've never heard of even 10,000 a day being harmful. All right, and this is only eight. Uh, did you say that you need added calcium uh, for the vitamin D to work better? Um, you need a, a good ratio of calcium to phosphate and uh I think it's it's really protective to take in well over a thousand. I try to get oh, uh, about twenty five hundred milligrams of calcium per day. I see. And what are the good? What are the foods that are good for that? Milk, cheese, and uh, leafy greens that are well cooked, and the water they cook in. They have to be cooked because I eat a lot of salad, but those aren't cooked. So they, you know. Yeah, we can't digest uh, uh, raw leaves. So most of the calcium is, is not being assimilated from salad greens. So I should eat, like, cooked broccoli or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. How much? Anything green, like green beans, anything that's green has uh, calcium? Uh, oh, um, uh, uh, one or two big servings of, uh, of uh, kale or, or um, uh, chard would, would give you a a good part of your day's requirement, but uh, I think the best way is to have more than a quart a day of, of uh, low-fat milk. Well, I can't possibly drink a quart a day of milk. I eat a little cheese, you know, and uh, sometimes uh, a little sour cream. Ju but... Just for example, um, can I just ask you this? How much do, how much do you weigh? I'm going to tell you that. No, you should. Come on. You don't ask a lady her age or her weight. <laughs> no, no, it's important. I need to ask you. You need to tell me. <laughs> I ain't going to tell you. Okay, well, Dr. Pete, I, thanks, for, thanks for your call. I wanted to do a... Well, what, what, what does it have to do with my weight? Oh, it has a huge amount. Um, so if you like... I'm I'll, a bit on the heavy side. Let's say that. Yeah. Well, there's been very, very, very positive associations with a inability to absorb vitamin D. Uh, and I'm not saying you're obese, but in obese people. So the body fat has a direct... Uh, uh, yeah, a suppressing effect on vitamin D absorption. So, Dr. P, how about that? You, you understand that. Well, vitamin D and calcium both have a direct suppressive effect on fat formation. Uh, the um, uh, fatty liver, for example, uh, is, uh, in animal studies, it's corrected by both vitamin D and calcium. So that, that suppresses fat. That will help you not get so fat if you eat vitamin yeah. D and calcium. And, and the high calcium intake by itself just with a normal amount of vitamin D is very effective at preventing overweight. Oh, well, that's good to know. And what did you say would happen to the kidneys? That was uh, something bad would happen to the kidneys from not having enough calcium or yeah. not enough calcium and vitamin D? Um, not enough calcium and vitamin D. Uh, or too much phosphate, uh, that the um, combination, any of those, will cause your parathyroid hormone to increase. And elevated phosphate and elevated parathyroid hormone uh, are very toxic to the kidneys. Uh, well, I actually had a, um, an overactive thyroid um, that I had developed a few years ago. I hadn't had it before. And that led to atrial, atrial fibrillation problems. And I had a radioactive iodine uh, to shrink the thyroid. So now I take uh, 88 mil uh, micrograms a day of thyroid to keep it up to the normal level. So I assume I'm getting the normal level of thyroid that I need. Uh, yeah, thyroid works in many ways uh, similarly to vitamin D and uh, regulates uh, calcium and magnesium in particular. Well, I'm taking both, so I guess uh, that's a good thing. 
Okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you for your call. Uh, we do have another caller, so let's get this call. And uh, the lights are flashing again, so let's take this call, call away from. What's your question? I am calling you from Finland in Scandinavia. <laughs> thank you. And <laughs> Finland. Okay. I cool. was wondering if, um, if uh, yourself or Dr. Pete could enlighten me about uh, sediment in the urine. Mm-hmm. Is this a good thing? Is it normal? Um, any observation about uh, sediment in the urine? Yeah. Okay. Well, do you, first of all, do you know, uh, is this sediment, is it a solid sediment or are you talking about a, uh, an amorphous kind of sediment that's actually part of the uh, fluid makeup? I mean, is it crystalline? Yeah, like a, like a dust, like cloudy. If you, if you let it, um, uh, let's say if you would, um, uh, urinate in a jar and, mm-hmm. and, and let it sit, it would, it would have, it would make a, a, a cloud kind of a, have you um, have you ever had any investigations for any kind of uh, kidney stones or any type of uh, uh, calculi that you, you know of? Or um, I've, I've I've never had an issue with that. Um, I actually uh, started investigating that when I heard claims from um, uh, people eating mostly fruit that uh, this might be a sign of good. Uh, assimilation of uh, or good function of the kidneys, but um, I, I'm not sure about the um, the scientific claims uh, concerning that. Okay, Dr. P, what do you uh, what do you think? Um, yes. If you have a, a fairly high protein intake and your urine is uh, on the acid side, down around pH five, and you have a very high calcium intake, say from the equivalent of two liters of milk per day, uh, you'll have a lot of calcium uh, appearing in the urine. And if the urine is acidic, it isn't likely to form stones. But when it stands, the pH uh, can rise. uh, And as the carbon dioxide uh, evaporates, uh, and uh, that can precipitate uh, crystals. Uh, So it other things being equal, it, it isn't necessarily harmful to, to have a precipitation in, in the urine. Okay, well, did you get thank that? Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yes. Thank, thank you for your call. Uh, okay, just quickly switching to uh, urine as a, a kind of urinalysis. And do you, do you think that people that have clear urine are, uh, for want of a better word, healthy compared to those people that have not cloudy through pigmentation, but, um, you know, uh, less than see-through, so opaque-type urines. Do you, do you know if there's any association uh, with that? Because I'm sure people have wide-ranging presentations from both colour and opacity. I think the clarity is largely from the amount of fluid you're drinking. And uh, if the urine is acidic, I don't think uh, some cloudiness is going to hurt. But... Um, there can be bad causes of cloudiness, uh, infection, for example. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think the, uh, the yellow color of urine is considered to indicate uh, cell turnover. Uh, so sometimes the, the morning urine will be uh, yellow and the afternoon urine clear uh, because during the night uh, with the high stress hormones, a lot of cells are breaking down, and the uh, uh, the fragments of the nucleic acids turning over, I think, uh, can produce some of the yellow pigment. Okay, well, I'm uh, I'm afraid that is all we've got time for because we're coming up close to two minutes to eight. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Dr. Pete. Um, I, I wanted to mention that the clotho protein that we talked about a few months ago, right? Okay, which is the anti-aging protein. Yeah. Um, it's uh, very similar to um, vitamin D in some of its functions. A vitamin D deficiency produces uh, the degenerative changes that a, a mutation or deficiency of the clotho protein can produce. Interesting. Well, I really wanted to talk more to you about um, the vitamin D receptor um, and how that could be enhanced, because I think vitamin D uh, is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of 
the process of inflammation and all the diseases associated with it. So maybe next month we can pick up uh, just the last part of uh, what I wanted to look at with vitamin D and maybe uh, bring the vitamin D receptor into a more light and help people understand how important vitamin D is to get, especially now we're going into the darker times of the year. So thanks so much for your time, Dr. Pete. Uh, the calcium metabolism and sugar oxidation is another subject. We all right, talk excellent. About. Good. I've got some notes here. Thanks, thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, so for those people that have listened to the show this evening, uh, thanks for either calling in or listening. I can only hope that there's lots of people out there who listened and didn't call, uh, but I would also stress the point that this is a funded radio station. Uh, we do need your financial support, so hopefully the uh, phone will ring off the hook once 8 o'clock comes around here and people will start pledging. Uh, for those of you who've listened to the show, uh, thanks so much. The truth is out there. There's lots of information on the Internet. Uh, don't believe the media. The media is dying. Uh, in fact, the media is virtually dead. I think it's got a 6% trust rating at this point in time. So uh, thanks for listening, and until December uh, next month, good night. <laughs>